It is important that you always appreciate people for their influence and impact in your life because guess what? You will be the next person making it to where they've been and you also expect others to do the same to you. You're welcome to another insightful and heartwarming episode of Impact Stories where we bring you the life and achievement of our academic mentors. And my name is Ajima Notredako. Today with me on Impact Stories is one very very wonderful, amazing, exquisite. And I mean, I can add many more unless you know who we're talking about so you can appreciate uh, how unique she is and how she'd make great achievements as an academic mentor. So don't go anywhere, don't touch that dial, don't touch your tablet, don't go anywhere, stay with me. I'll be right back, I'll let you know who she is. And as usual, we will talk about her work. Stay with me. Welcome back to Impact Stories on AAU TV, celebrating the life and achievements of our academic mentors. And today I have here with me, Dr. Bishop Susan Inti. She is the Chief Operating Officer at the Action Chapel International and also had a legal affairs at the Action Chapel International. Yeah, and also Director at the Dominion Christian Academy here in Accra. And you know, she's a consecrated bishop very articulate, very professional. She's an educator and also a consultant. Doc, you're welcome to Impact Stories. Thank you so much for having me. Great. Um, I mean, it's overwhelming, um, taking a good look through your achievements. And it tells me, wow, how does one begin from one point to get to where you are? I believe you've been through quite a lot by you being able to inspire yourself to this point. But we'll begin from the basics. Um, where did it all start for Dr. Bishop Zaninti? Well, it started off with uh, an adventurous Ghanaian man who was studying in the UK and he went on a trip to the Netherlands where he met another adventurous young lady who couldn't speak English, my mother. And um, that's where it all started. They moved my mother moved from the Netherlands to the UK, and um, that's where I was born. I have an older brother. And um, my father joined the army in Ghana, and so they moved back to Ghana in 1961. And I grew up in Ghana with a Ghanaian father and a Dutch mother. Mm. That's inspiring. Uh, where were you in Ghana, and where did you start your education? Ed education? Um, I lived in Burma camp. I started my life off as a military child and uh, I went to services primary school in Burma camp and then from there I went to a Buri girls mm. secondary school. Splendid. You know they say um, back, back in early school um, they ask people what do you want to be in future and then I think at that point it becomes so um, we opened up our minds and said we want to be a pilot, we want to be astronauts. What did you say at that moment when you were to ask what do you want to be in the future? Um, my first response that I remember was in about Form 1 or Form 2 when an evangelist came to minister at our school. Um, I believe it was Spencer Duncan and uh, he shared a scripture, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And I remember saying in my heart that that's what I want to be. Because at that time I had started boarding school, it was very difficult for me to leave home and go to um, Aburi girls. And I think Christianity and the Bible and scripture union gave me that peace and comfort. So at that very early age, I wanted to be somebody who took the gospel around to others. I remember speaking to my mom at the time and my mother was like, you know, you need to be a professional. You need to do something that will bring money. I think the perception at the time was that People who preached the gospel were always um, out of pocket or poor. 
And so that passion or that desire was quickly quenched. That's unfortunate. Um, but you, 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 so what happened next? What was your next move? You, you know, when you moved to more of like quiet, um, the creative jobs? Or you start, I did. Start thinking about those things. Yes. What happened next? So um, I could talk and I could debate and I could question. So my father said I'd be a good lawyer. Um, so I went to the UK and I did my law degree. I completed my solicitor's finals and um, I went for an interview and I realized that some people had race issues or racist mindsets. So I went back into education to do a master's in business law so that when I finished studying, I would have an edge for my training contract. So I managed to complete my, my legal studies and um, ended up being a professional at that point. So you practiced a couple of times? I practiced for a while, but I knew that it's not what I wanted to be. Mm. I, I had social justice issues and I couldn't reconcile um, my, my compassion with the money-making aspect of the legal practice. So when you moved to Ghana, did you intend to practice law in Ghana as well? No, we lived in the UK um, for 35 years. And in the UK, I moved into business. I did an MBA so that I can move into management. I managed a number of the businesses that we run, my husband and myself. So I was run, run, managing the back office. We set up a business in the Netherlands. We were in the Netherlands for a number of years. So we set up a business, a consultancy in the Netherlands. So I was managing the um, office end of it. And um, in the UK as well, I managed the family business. I started another business um, in 1995, working with children, a daycare provision. And so I run that business. And then I went into education. So I did my education qualifications in the UK and I worked in different types of schools, teaching um, secondary school students, business, ICT, economics, um, to GCSE level and to A level. And then I also did a lot of ministry work um, in terms of starting a church in the UK. I started a Bible college to train um, teacher, people who wanted to teach and pastor. So I started that in the UK and I also um, did a bachelor's, a master's, a PhD in theological studies mm. to back that. That's inspiring. They say um, there should be a calling um, to whatever you want to do when it comes to the ministry. Was there a point in your life you felt that this is my calling? Uh, any turnaround moment, you know, yeah, this, this is my calling. I have to just drop everything and then pick the cross and then move. Yeah, um, when I rededicated my life to the Lord in 1986, I knew that I needed to walk according to the word. So I needed to align my life with the word of God. So at that point, I realized that I needed to study the word. So I enrolled in a part-time course at the Hampstead Bible School with Reverend Dr. Michael Bassett. But the part-time was not enough for me because I needed, I have a thirst for studying, which is why you know I probably have seven postgraduate um, qualifications in different fields because I just love to study and I hate being ignorant. <laughs> so um, I studied the word and I knew, I knew I had a calling, but having been raised in Ghana, I, my answer 
to the call was always call my husband and I will help him. So I didn't take it as my call. I took it as his call because of the way I had been socialized in Ghana. Um, I wasn't confident enough to step out into my call. So it was in 2001 that um, I had a ch chance meeting with a minister in Milton Keynes. And he asked me what I was waiting for. And I said, um, I wasn't sure what I was waiting for. And he said, well, if you obey what God has called you to do, um, people will get blessed. And I was so concerned with what people would say rather than what my obedience to the call of God would cause or the consequences or the impact of my obedience. So I had an, uh, an encounter um, in 2001 when I was praying and the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and told me to get organized because they were coming and I heard an audible voice. I mean, I've had experiences in my past where I was paralyzed, pregnant with twins and paralyzed in 1991. And um, when the Holy Spirit told me exactly when I would start walking. So I know that voice because I started walking exactly two months after I had that encounter. And when I heard the voice of the spirit telling me that I would walk in two months. I turned to my husband because he had carried me from my wheelchair into the car and was, um, we were in Golders Green and at the traffic light, the Holy Spirit just said to me, in two months, you will be walking. So I turned to my husband and I said, in two months, the Holy Spirit has told me I would be walking. We dro he drove home put me in the wheelchair, wheeled me into the house. And a lady that I've never met in my life was there with my mom who had come to look after um, the twins because I was pregnant with twins. So we'd, I'd had the delivery by cesarean section. And as soon as he wheeled me into the living room, my mother said to the lady, oh, look at my daughter. And the lady said to my mom, don't worry, Betty, she'll be walking in two months. Mm -hmm. So I know that voice. And in 2001, I heard that voice telling me to get organized. They are coming, you know, talking about people coming, talking about just do what God had, has asked you to do. I had a crusade. I organized a crusade in Milton Keynes and three people gave their lives to the Lord. And then they looked at me and they said, so what are we going to do? And I heard myself saying, come to church on Sunday. And so that is how the church in the UK started, on eagle's wings. I think it, it settles in when, amidst all these, you were still pursuing your education. Yes. What was the inspiration blending, learning with the, the gospel work and you holding these two together at that moment? It just came to me naturally. Because Christianity is a lifestyle. It's, you know, it's, you express what Christ in you. And Christ in you can express in so many ways. So the passion for studying and the passion, I was working and doing ministry. And um, I, Paul was a tent maker. He was going to Ephesus, going to you know, Corinth, going to Galatia, going to Asia Minor, but he was a tent maker. So when he wasn't in ministry, he was working. And so for me, um, being in ministry is part of your life, just as working is part of you, your life. Um, I'm in the fortunate position where I can do both. And um, if it comes to the point where 24, you know, I need to be in full time, then I would have. But at all stages of my life, I just have managed, like many people, to just do both. Be a minister and 
be whatever I need to be. So it is true they say that if you want to just achieve any goal, it's about you deciding and you believing in yourself, you can do it. So I have a maid, Dr. Susan T. She is a bishop and also an academic mentor. You want to know more about her challenges and then how she sailed through. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Impact Stories on AAU TV, celebrating the life and achievements of our academic mentors. And today I am here with Dr. Bishop Susan T. Doc, back to the very moments, I mean, in your life. You've been through a lot. I mean, I can, I can, I can just perceive, but you should tell me or tell us how it's been for you. Um, I know the very first one with um, your paralysis and you selling through. What are some of the other mountains you had to climb to see the apex? You know, I've been through quite a number of challenges and deep valleys, just like everyone. But, you know, I thank God that he says even the valleys will become as a plain and the mountains will be leveled and the crooked paths will be made straight. And I think that's the grace and the mercy of God. I mean, I went into um law very naive you know i had been studying i went in to do my my first degree i went straight into the um my solicitor's finals then i went into my masters so i had spent my life in academia when i qualified i was very naive um, in terms of understanding the business world and how it operated because I'd been quite shielded and in academia. And I think the key is having placement years. You know, sometimes they talk about a sandwich course where you do um, two years, then you do a one year placement in your area of study, which universities assist you with, and then you go back in to finish the qualification sure. and I recommend that greatly because it gives you an insight into the area of study and if you go into that placement year you might even find out that you are not doing the course that you should be doing yeah. rather than going through the three years in some universities and then coming out and then discovering that no that is not what I wanted to be doing and I found myself in that position where, yes, I had the knowledge, but I wasn't sure that was exactly the kind of environment that I wanted to be working in. And um, I think for any university student or any graduate, it is so, so, so important that you have mentors. You have people who have walked that way, who can share with you their insight to make sure that you are on the right track because you know you can be on a train and you get to your destination and that is not the train you should have been getting on and that's why we have signposts along the way you know like you have stations which tells you we're going in this direction and i think that is very important because i think i was being educated at a time where certain qualifications were preferred because people thought they were lucrative qualifications, like being a lawyer, being a doctor, being um, an architect. But some, there are other, so many other professions um, and so many other qualifications that people can pursue. And they can be areas of passion rather than feeling that they need to do it because they need to put food on the table. And I found myself that at the end of that study, you know, I should have done, or I may have been better off doing a business management or a business administration um, qualification. So I think mentoring and placements are very important for helping young people make sure that they're doing the right course to take them to the right place, because you need to have a passion for what you are studying. It's gonna be a lifetime thing. Would you say you were kind of like 
um, lured to start uh, a program that you didn't really desire um, to start and eventually you realize that well I could have done something different that uh, inured to my interests and not this one. Was that the case for you now? Yeah, and I think we were educated in the 70s with having um, economic challenges in the country. Your parents wanted you to make, they wanted to make sure that you were studying something that would give you, you know, make you independent, make you a professional, etc. And because of that, a lot of people were doing things that they were not passionate about. And I think I fell into that category with the law because I was more interested. I mean, I'm not saying that because God always uses everything for your good. So it worked out because I have all that knowledge and I can use it with everything that I do and in everything I do. And I'm even using it right now. You, you, you expressed that. I mean, you, you went out looking for a job uh, with your law certificate and then you were looked on upon because of you, because you were black. And I was a woman. And you were a woman. Yes. How did you feel that moment? Oh, it was, it, was, it was as if I'd been slapped. You know, coming from a white mother and a black father in Ghana and seeing black and white working together, um, where white and white or black and black don't work, I had seen it working and I knew that it's not about your color, it's about your heart. So I grew up knowing that it's about the heart of a person and not about their color because I had seen it work. Um, and when I was confronted with the racism, direct racism, I, I couldn't believe that, especially because I had gone for an interview in a, in a predominantly black environment, Hackney in London, and I was like, but if that is the way that you think about the people that you are working with, that they have handicaps, then how are we going to move this forward? So it was because of that that I went for a further postgraduate degree so that I would have that edge. What difference, what, what difference did that postgraduate degree make in what you wanted to achieve? I think it gave me a bit more com confidence, gave me a bit more confidence and it's given me the the knowledge and the understanding because I did international trade I did the maritime law I did the law of air land I did um, comparative tax you know law so I did tax law and I did um, comparative company law so it just broadened my um, my academic um, understanding. understanding of the subjects and you know I use that today mm. when did you move to Ghana from the UK and what did you start to do when you got to Ghana well I moved to Ghana in 2011 my parents were growing old and I wanted to spend more time with them my father was um, suffering from glaucoma and I felt that I needed to be here so I came in 20 11 and I worked as the deputy director of the Judicial Training Institute with Judicial Service of Ghana and I worked there for a year um, that was really good um, I met so many wonderful people um, I worked within the civil service well judicial service and I gleaned a lot of insight into um, public sector working in Ghana um, I m went back to the UK because my husband was still there. And then in 2015, we both moved back to Ghana. He got a, a job in a diplomatic mission in Ghana. And I came along because this is where I wanted to be anyway. And I started off doing a bit of management consulting. And a friend of mine asked me to do some professional development for her international school. So I started doing that and she lost her head of secondary. So she asked me to step in. So for four years, I was the head of secondary in an international school. Um, that was an IB school and also a Cambridge school. 
your husband seems to um, have supported you and uh, have held your back for I mean all, throughout your endeavors and that is where you people want to know uh, exactly how she met the, the husband okay and how supportive he has been so let's just zoom to that one how did you meet your husband he was also in the UK he also came to study in the UK and uh, he actually came to my office for uh, um, for uh, when I was working as a lawyer he came as a client mm. yeah that's a blessing this guys that's interesting, right? There. But I'd met him seven years before. Oh, how? He had come to visit me, and uh, but I, we, I didn't hit it off with him, you know. So we, I met him seven years later, and then. So what? What, what am I saying? You never know. You never know. You know. So I mean, fast forward. Yes. In Ghana, from judicial service, uh, how did it? Did it what happened next? You're in Action Chapel. I want to see how the connection between uh, being with the uh, civil service, uh, the judiciary, and also ending up with the Action Chapel. All right, so my story with Action Chapel goes back to 1987. 1987, when um, we were in the UK, and His Eminence, the Archbishop, who was Pastor Nick at the time, um, came to do a program and my husband and I, we were dating at the time, we went to the program in Kensington Town Hall. And um, through that, he wanted to set up the London branch of Action Chapel, Christian Action Faith Ministries. And we were the six founding members of the London branch of CAFM, Action Chapel International. That's a big congratulations right there. Yeah, I mean, this small seed that was sown is now a big church. I think we have nine branches. We have about six regional bishops there. And um, His Eminence then came to minister at our wedding in October 1988. And we've just maintained um, a very good relationship. So when I was resigning from my last role in the international school in 2020, just before COVID, he said, uh, if I'm resigning, then there's, I need to come back home. And so he appointed me as the CEO of Action Chapel International. I mean, then you also leverage with your legal uh, Everything. Ability as well. Everything. You're also a uh, director for the Dominion Christian Academy. Yes, I am. Uh, how is it thus far working as director in such an academy like that? Well, we started, the, um, His Eminence, the Archbishop, has always been interested in education. And um, he wants to make, ensure that children have the best start in life. So. Um, his vision for a Christian academy is Dominion Christian Academy. So he gave me the mandate to set it up. So we set it up last year, August, September. We opened our doors on the 6th of September, 2021, and we are growing. So uh, what are some of your uh, okay, curricula set up that you run here? Well, we run the Cambridge checkpoints, IGCSE, A-levels, because that's the British pathway. We also run the American New York State Education um, curricula, because a lot of students want to go either to universities in America or the UK or South Africa. And it's quite a rigorous um, curricula. It is globally minded. It prepares students for studying abroad and even studying here in Ghana. It makes them, it deals with a lot of the um, pedagogy, the type, the approaches and teaching methods to um, learning. So we want children who are critical thinkers, they are good communicators, they are reflectors, they are thinkers. Um, we want them to experience 
um, experiential learning, inquiry-based learning, research-based learning. So we want to make the curricula as globally acceptable as possible so that it doesn't matter where the children end up or go, they are prepared to work in any system, not just the Ghanaian system. Mm. Beyond your occupational portfolio, there are other things that you've done to sustain and grow the Ghanaian educational discipline. What have you, tell us about the wonderful things you've done. In Ghana, yeah. educational wise, yeah. apart from what I've done, let's see. Um, I'm on the board of E-Crime Bureau, which is a cybersecurity organization. Um, and it's the, been an award winner, a JITA award winner for four years, three or four years. We've won the leading company for cybersecurity. And obviously, I bring all these knowledge and um, experiences into creating a good learning environment for students. Um, I'd like to do more in education in Ghana, um, given the opportunity to help other students across the board. Um, I'm also the co-founder of Ghana Women's Empowerment Network. We have about 2,500 women on our social media platform just for networking and empowering women and encouraging them um, to be all that God has created them to be. Um, and also share knowledge in terms of, you know, people are always pushing boundaries and we need to empower people, students, women, men, to be all that um, they can be and also to share best practice, share experiences, mentor others. I'm part of um, a partner for one-to-one -one mentoring, which is an organization set up by um, a consultant pediatrician about men, uh, you know, they mentor students who want to be medical students um, across the globe, especially Ghanaian students who want to be doctors, um, any le uh, medical profession. And we need more of those kind of organizations that partner with universities and partner with students to help them, uh, you know, walk into their futures and walk into their destinies. I remember when, you know, you said something at the beginning of the, uh, the interview, you were talking about people who have trailblazed or people who've done it before. And I remember when I went to Kiev in 2009 with Pastor Sunday Adelaja, who had the biggest church in Kiev at the time. And he made us, those who went on the retreat, he made us choose five people whose lives we really admired. And he, part of the work was to look through their biography and see what they had done to get where they, they are. I'm interested in what you chose. Oh, I chose, I, can I remember? They were all presidents and they were all um, heads of states. And, you know, like if you ask me who do I admire, probably Angela Merkel, mm -hmm. you know, people who have risen to the top of their game, you know, risen to um, be in leadership, top leadership. I mean, I have always, felt that women should be in leadership because I don't believe leadership is male. I believe headship, Christian headship in the marriage is male, but I don't believe leadership is male. Anyone can be a leader, even if you're leading your children, even if you're leading a dog, you're a leader. And um, so I'm always interested in leadership and I'm privileged to be consecrated one of the first group of women bishops to be create, um, consecrated by His Eminence, the Archbishop. That's leadership. And um, I believe that we can look at the lives of people in leadership and it'll help us align our, our lives and 
see how we can achieve greater heights than they did because we wouldn't make the mistakes that they did when you read their lives you know some of them made mistakes leaders make mistakes and we can avoid the pitfalls and the potholes if we read their biographies and understand the things that don't help for making to, for taking us where we want to go do you run a youth mentorship program um, I mentor a few people. I'd like to do more in terms of mentorship, which is why I'm part of the one-to-one -one mentoring program. And um, we should help. Sure. I think that there are a million youths out there who are inspired by your life and the tragedy you've come. Um, they see in you perhaps a very strong-hearted a uh, very dedicated, committed and focused woman who has achieved and always has tested for achievements, believes in her strength. What would you want to say to inspire them uh, amidst your challenges and all the, your, your successes? Uh, what would you want to say to also ignite their passion and keep them focused out there? I'd like to say that, you know, God has a plan for each person. And it might seem difficult and it might seem daunting and it might seem challenging, but never, ever, ever lose your dream. That's what I will say. And never, ever quit. Don't take no for an answer if it is not from God. And what I will say is just be humble. You know, there's this two scriptures in the Bible. It says, David, even when David had challenges with King Saul, who was on the throne, it says David behaved himself wisely. And one thing that I'll say is always behave yourself wi wisely. Someone said to me, live as if you live in a fishbowl. Because if you live as if you are living in a fishbowl, you are aware of everything that you do. And that will help you not make any mistakes that you will regret. And also David, it says about David that the gentleness, his gentleness, that means God's gentleness made him great. He started off as a shepherd boy, a shepherd boy. I mean, shepherd people were insignificant. And just because you, are, you feel insignificant today doesn't mean that is your destiny. You know, there are times when it's the silent years, you're just grafting, you're just working hard. Just stay focused and don't lose your dream. That's so wonderful. So I think it's, it's a very big word, but carve yours to be a fishbowl. Just stay quite composed, be humble. And as uh, Doc Bishop has said, you are going to achieve your goals. Thank you so much, Dr. They will. For your time with us on Impact Stories. I mean, I'm inspired. I'm very inspired. As you can see from my face, I'm inspired. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we want to say that thank you very much for your, your remarks to young people out there to stay composed, stay humble, and know so. And, and if they make mistakes, they need to get up. Mm. Don't stay there, just get up. And that, and that answered beautifully. So, when you make mistakes, just get up, dust them off, and then move forward. Thank you very much for your time on Impact Stories. And we're glad celebrating the life and achievements of Dr. Bishop Zalinti and here at the Action Chapel International. And I believe you're inspired. Just keep watching the Impact Stories on AAU TV. Be inspired with our academic mentors. Have a nice day. My name is Ajibo Notre Bye.